Can I have your attention, please? At this time, please place all electronic devices to vibrate. Please place all electronic devices to vibrate. Uh, council members, you will have the ability to mute and unmute yourself. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader. Majority Leader Cumbo, are you there? Yes, I am. We're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we're ready to begin. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the recess stated meeting of May 28th, 2020, being held on June 18th, 2020. I am Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual meeting of the New York City Council. If you would like to follow along, the agenda for today's meeting is posted on our website. I personally will not be pledging my allegiance to the United States of America, but certainly respect those who choose to do so at this time. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of, the United of the United States, States of America, America to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, and one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Adams. Present. Epri Samuel. Present. Ayala. Present. Baron. Thank you. Borelli. Present. Brannon. Cabrera. Present. Chin. Present. Cohen. Logged on. Constantinides. With video pro a problem as indicated, but I am here. So Cornegie. Thank you. Thank you. Deutsch. I'm here. I'm sorry, Diaz. Okay. Yeah. Drum. I want you to put it so that we can see a nice clear picture. Here. Eugene. I'm here. Present. Gibson. Present. Jonai. Present. Bredenchik. Here. Holden. Here. Kalos. Here. King. Ku. So right Thank you. Screen. I'm sorry, Ku. Present. Kozlowitz. Lanceman. Present. Lander. I'm here. Levin. Present. Levine. I'm here. Lewis. Lewis. Okay, so put Menchaca. Presente. Miller. Present. Moya. Present. Perkins. Go ahead, go ahead. Powers. Here. Why should I say it again? Oh, because they have muted you, but they have. Reynoso. Here. Richards. Present. Rivera. Present. Rodriguez. Here. 
Rose. Present. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Present. Traeger. Here. Ulrich. President. Alone. Here. Van Bramer. Here. Yeager. Here. Matteo. Here. Combo. Present. Speaker Johnson. I'm here. Madam Majority Leader, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. City Clerk. The recess stated meeting of May 28th, 2020 is hereby adjourned. We will now begin the stated meeting of June 18th, 2020. Roll Adam, call. Adam, thank you. Adams. Still present. Amphrey Samuel. Present. Ayala. Present. Aaron. Borelli. Present, sorry. Thank you. Brennan. Here. Cabrera. Present. Chin. Present. Oh. Cohen. Here. Constantinides. Carnegie. Present. Deutsch. Diaz. <laughs> Drum. Eugene. Gibson. Eugene, Eugene present. Oh, thank you. Present. Thank you, Council Member. Gibson present. Thank you. Jonai. Present. Gradenchik. Still here. Holden. Here. Kalos. Still here. King. Present. Kozlowitz. Here. <clears throat> Lanceman. Here. Lander. Here. Levin. Yeah. Here. Thank you. Le uh, Levine. Here. Lewis. Still present. Thank you. Mizell. Can I raise my hand? Menchaca. Presente. Miller. Moya. Presente. Perkins. Present. Powers. Present. Reynoso. Present. Richards. Present. Rivera. Present. Rodriguez. Rose. Present. Thank you. Rosenthal. Here. Salamanca. Present. Torres. Present. Traeger. 
Present. Ulrich. Present. Malone. Here. Van Bramer. Here. Jaeger. Here. Matteo. Here. Combo. Present. Speaker Johnson. I'm here. We have a quorum. Do you have me, Constantinus? Do you have me as well? Uh, yes, we do. Yes, we do, Council Member. Thank you. We will now have today's invocation, which will be delivered by Reverend Eunice Coleman, spiritual leader at Rivers of Living Water Ministries, UCC, located at 263 West 86th Street in Manhattan. Good afternoon, everyone. <sighs> to the all-knowing, the all-loving, the divine presence, the great I am, Emmanuel, eternal I amness, light, love, the one, we pray. There is one life, the life of God, therefore I am. There is one universal creative intelligence, therefore I am. There is one mind, the mind of God, therefore I am. Love is universal spirit in action, therefore I am. God is, therefore I am. I am that I am, therefore I am. For all of us gathered here today, albeit virtually, we ask for strength and wisdom to wholly support those for whom we are gathered. We ask you for your blessings as we move forward as one, guiding us along the way. Let us take this time on this day to develop what is needed and wanted. Let us hear and discern the voices of those we serve as we attempt to provide for them, allowing their lead when needed and covering them when necessary. We come together invoking your presence here to do the work that ought to be done in them, through them, and for them. We ask for your presence here, eyes open, minds open, hearts open. In the name of all that is good and just and right for them all, for us all. Amen, Ashe, and so it is. Thank you, Reverend Coleman. I'd now ask Council Member Rosenthal to spread the beautiful invocation onto the record. I am honored to have the opportunity to thank Reverend Coleman who became an ordained interfaith minister for the sole purpose of bringing life and divine love to their community. In 2013, Reverend Coleman made the milestone, life-changing, life-affirming decision to move forward in the process of transition and to become a visible activist for the transgender community within ministry. Reverend Coleman is the Eastern Regional Minister of Trans Saints a community of transgender faith leaders focused on the unique perspectives of the African-American trans community. Reverend Goldman is also a minister and board member at Rivers of Living Water NYUCC. He provides ministerial support with the National LGBT Task Force. He has provided chaplaincy services to the trans community at Rikers Island and he works closely with LGBTQ young people. For all of their incredible service to the TGNCNB community specifically and the LGBTQ plus community overall, Reverend Coleman was honored with the 2018 Humanitarian Award from Princess Janae Place 
and the 2019 inaugural National Trans Visibility March Torch Award, the Lois L. Bates Award. So thank you, Majority Leader Combo. I would like to thank Reverend Coldman for being here today and make a motion that the invocation be spread in full upon the record. Thank you so much, Council Member Rosenthal. We will now move into the adoption of minutes. None. Messages and papers from the mayor. <clears throat> None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. Finance. Petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. None. <clears throat> we will now have communication from Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Majority Leader. I also want to thank Reverend Coleman for being here today. That was a really beautiful uh, message that we got. So I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Thursday, as always. I hope you and your families are safe and well. Our city is slowly beginning to reopen and it is all due to the hard work of New Yorkers who flatten the curve. We are on the right path. Uh, and I wanna remind everyone that we need to stay committed to continue the progress that we've seen. The fight is not over. As of today, we have lost 22,199 New Yorkers. 22,199 New Yorkers to COVID-19, that number includes probable deaths. Before the pandemic began, we couldn't have fathomed this loss of life in such a short period of time. My heart is with every person who has lost a loved one to this terrible disease. And as we do at every stated meeting, I also want to acknowledge those who have died from 9-11 related illnesses since our last meeting. The FDNY lost firefighters William McCarthy and Paul McManaman, and the NYPD lost Detective Jewel Jenkins and Detective Leonard Kako Jr. Let's have a moment of silence for firefighters McCarthy and McManaman and Detectives Jenkins and Kako, and let's remember all the New Yorkers we've lost from COVID-19. Um, and, and, uh, if folks could mute their line, please. Thank you. Moving forward, I'd like to remind everyone that we have an upcoming primary. Uh, next Tuesday, June 23rd, and we have to make sure our voices are heard. I'll also remind everyone that absentee ballots must be postmarked by Monday, June 22nd. For those people who are voting in person, please remember to wear a mask and to socially distance while at the polls. I also want to wish everyone a very happy Father's Day to those who will be celebrating this Sunday. I'm always inspired by the amazing fathers who I know and who I love. I miss my father. He died in 2012 at 57 years old. Uh, and I'm thinking about him. He was a veteran. He was a Marine. Um, thinking of him. I'm also inspired by the many LGBT New Yorkers I know and love, which brings me to uh, our next item. And that is uh, wishing everyone a happy pride. This, of course, is a pride month like no other. Well, we won't be able to celebrate with the parades we typically have and the marches we typically have, uh, pride will go on. We had a great victory this past week, thanks to the tireless advocacy from advocates across the country. The Supreme Court on Monday banned employment discrimination against LGBT New Yorkers, uh, LGBT workers. And I think it's really important that we highlight that transgender Americans are protected under this decision this ruling reaffirms our right to live openly and honestly, and I couldn't be prouder to live in a city that codified this protection in 1986 for uh, LGB New Yorkers and in 2002 for transgender New Yorkers. During this month, it's important that we continue to recognize 
the intersectionality of black lives and queer lives. We know that our struggles are not always the same, but we must continue to fight today for the fair treatment of everyone under the law, especially black queer people, black trans people. I'd also like to acknowledge Juneteenth, which is tomorrow. It marks the end of slavery in the United States. This year's Juneteenth comes at a pivotal moment for our country. This nation and our city are crying for change. The murder of George Floyd, the latest in a long line of black Americans who died in law enforcement custody, triggered protests over police brutality and racist policies that have disproportionately harmed black women and men and trans people for generations. In New York City, people of all racial and economic backgrounds have flooded our streets to protest our current police system and demand change. And I want them to know that I have heard them. I believe everyone in this body in this chamber has heard them. As a white man, I will not and will never pretend to understand what black people have experienced in this country and in our city, but I am listening and I am committed to action. We can't keep repeating the names of black women and men who have been killed by police and continue to sit on the sidelines. Sandra Blonde, Tony McDade, Amadou Diallo, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Richard Brooks, Ahmed Arbery, uh, Abner Louima, Patrick Dorismond, Eric Garner, the list goes on. And we have to say that Black Lives Matter. Over the past few weeks, protests against police brutality have shown us that we must do better as a city in our own approach to policing. The relationship between community and police must change. As a body, it is up to us to use our power to enact this true change. These measures that we are voting on today increase accountability and transparency in the department and provide clear guidelines for addressing police misconduct. But I wanna be clear, we know that these measures are important, but this is the very beginning. To make real lasting structural transformative change, it's going to mean re-envisioning and rethinking and reimagining what policing looks like. It's going to mean looking in a serious way at the city's budget. And we hope the mayor will join us in our calls to cut significantly from the NYPD's budget and reinvest that money into communities of color, into housing and homelessness and mental health and schools and anti-violence programs and all the things that we know really work to get to the root of so much of this violence that we see in New York City. So now let's start on today's legislative agenda. Proposed introduction number 1354A, sponsored by Councilmember Robert Holden, would require all concrete mixer trucks driving through the city of New York to be equipped with a chute closure device during the transport of liquid concrete by June 30th, 2021. I wanna thank the staff who worked on this bill, Elliot Lynn and Alex Washington. The next is a package of legislation aimed at addressing police misconduct and enacting some substantial police reforms. Proposed introduction number 760B, sponsored by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, would require the New York City Police Department to expand the categories included in its early intervention system, which is used to identify problematic officers. The NYPD would also be required to increase transparency around its system by regularly reporting on the information included and how it's utilized. And I wanna thank Brian Crow from the staff for his work on this bill. The next is proposed introduction number 487A, sponsored by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and it would create civilian oversight over surveillance technologies used by the NYPD. The department would be required to issue a surveillance impact and use policy about these technologies, including a description of each technology's capabilities, any safeguards to protect information collected, and rules for how the technologies will be used, including any potential for disparate impacts on protected classes, such as race, religion, or sexual orientation. 
The inspector general for the NYPD would audit the surveillance impact and use policy to ensure compliance with its terms. I'm glad we're moving on this and I'm proud of the hard work that went into getting this right. I wanna thank the advocates for their hard work on this as well. Next is proposed introduction number 1309B sponsored by council member Donovan Richards, the chair of our public safety committee who has done a fantastic job over these last few weeks uh, and few months and during his entire time chairing the committee. And it will require the NYPD to develop a disciplinary matrix, which gives a recommended range of penalties for each type of violation. The bill would require public reporting on how the matrix was developed and when the commissioner deviates from the matrix recommendation on these two bills, I wanna thank from the staff, Daniel Adis. Next is proposed introduction number 16, number 1962A, sponsored by council member Alika Amprey Samuel, which would require officers to make their badge numbers visible at all times when they are performing their official duties. This bill would also allow someone to sue if an officer refuses to display their shield number or rank designation. This bill is important because we saw at citywide protests, we had uh, some officers who were hiding their information and that is totally unacceptable. Next, proposed introduction number 721B, sponsored by our public advocate, Jumani Williams, would affirm the right to film police activities generally and establish a cause of action enabling individuals to sue in state court for any violation of this right. Police brutality is nothing new, but cell phones are. The fact that so many instances of brutality and people losing their lives and being killed have been filmed has helped the world see the depth of this longstanding problem. And we must make sure that the right to film police activities is codified into law. Next is a resolution by council member Carlina Rivera, which urges the US Congress to pass the Eric Garner Excessive Use of Force Prevention Act of 2019, which is sponsored by Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. If made law, this bill would make the use of chokeholds a civil rights violation. This would enable federal authorities to hold accountable police officers who use this deadly technique. And on these bills, I wanna thank the staff. I wanna thank Brian Crow. Finally, the council's taking a historic step to affirm the ban on chokeholds and make the use of them by law enforcement punishable by law. I don't have to tell New Yorkers why this bill is important. When George Floyd cried, I can't breathe, or mama, it was a tragic reminder for all of us of Eric Garner, who died on a sidewalk in Staten Island, killed because of a police chokehold. This legislation is long overdue. We are taking this action today to honor the memory of Eric Garner. We were proud to stand with his mother, Gwen Carr, a few weeks ago. And this bill proposed introduction number 536B, sponsored by Councilmember Roy Lansman, the chair of our committee on the justice system, would make it illegal for an arresting officer to use a restraint that restricts the flow of air or blood by compressing another individual's windpipe or the arteries on the side of the neck or putting pressure on the back or the chest. And I wanna thank from the staff, Maxwell Kampfner for his work on this bill. Is our public advocate with us today? Yes, ma'am. Great. Before I turn it back to you, uh, Madam Majority Leader, I wanna turn the floor over to public advocate, Jumani Williams to speak about his bill and the other bills that we are considering today. Uh, I wanna recognize him during speaker time so he has as much time as he needs to discuss this package of critical criminal justice reform bills. And I wanna thank him for his leadership, not just over the last many weeks since the protests started in New York City after the murder of George Floyd, but uh, we in the council know that council member, that sorry, public advocate Williams, former council member Williams, has been leading on these issues for many years. In 2012, on the Community Safety Act and pushing these bills during his entire time in office, being out there in the streets, uh, shining a light on these injustices every step of the way. 
We are really grateful for his leadership. We're grateful that he was a member of this body and that now he is public advocate of the city of New York, where he has an even bigger platform to work on these issues and to shine the light on this brutality and on these reforms that he has worked on for years. So public advocate Williams, I'm grateful that you're here today and I wanna thank you for your leadership and give you as much time as you need to discuss your bill, but also the other bills that we're considering today. You're on thank mute. You so, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you and uh, the majority leader for uh, giving me some time to speak today and the, indeed the entire council for giving me a small amount of time to speak today. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, you, uh, Speaker. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the chair, Donovan Richards, uh, for all of your work in getting these bills forward. Uh, I do wanna lift up something you've said in, in previous press conferences uh, in actually acknowledging uh, that a lot of these could have been done before and acknowledging uh, your role in making sure that, that it moves forward now and what you could have done before. I think that's a real important part of this conversation and something uh, that our leaders uh, could learn from. Uh, and I wish uh, our uh, mayor would take the same tactic he seems to always be in defensive posture. So I want to thank you for those statements. Uh, and even uh, our governor, I think, could learn uh, for some of the verbiage that you used. Um, but I'm proud of this body today for pushing forward uh, this package of legislation. Uh, my bill or the right to record, uh, we have been obviously uh, trying to push forward uh, for some time to reaffirm uh, people's right to uh, record the police. Obviously, if they're not in uh, interfering, interfering with uh, police activity. Um, it does uh, do some things that the recent state bill does not do. Uh, so uh, we're, we're thankful that we're able to push that through. But, you know, even more importantly, uh, the time we're in, uh, I'm proud that this council is taking leadership. Uh, but I wanna make sure that this body continues to push on the overarching conversation, which is redefining what public safety is, and, uh, making sure that people don't get stuck on the policing, which is important, but the same issues we have in policing, as you alluded to, we have in housing, we have in education, uh, we have in healthcare and mental health, uh, we have in uh, making sure that people have quality jobs so they can get healthy food on the table. And that conversation is uh, just so important and hoping people don't get caught up in the terminology of defund the police versus divest or reinvest. Uh, I'm okay with all those terminologies because they all mean uh, one thing, there has been too much money given to uh, police departments and not enough in the other places that set up social structures that redefine what public safety is. And the places where people have all the things that we spoke about, public safety looks a lot different. Uh, we're moving into a, a new phase and it takes real leadership to have those honest discussions about structural inequities that have been around for far too long. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you uh, I wanted to shout out my team and of course uh, the council's uh, the council's team, uh, but on, on my side, uh, Nick Smith, Veronica Abies, the entire policy department, but especially Casey Addison, whom uh, many of you may know, this is her, her first bill uh, she worked on while she was in my office. So thank you again so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to the leadership that this council is gonna provide. Please continue to push this mayor. Um, sadly, he is not providing the leadership that he said he would. This is me speaking. Uh, we have an opportunity for this budget to really, really reflect the equity and justice um, that he campaigned on, but I don't see delivered. Uh, I believe this council can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate, for, for that. And yes, I do think it's important to normalize apologizing and saying when we were wrong. And I, I have acknowledged that and will continue to do that. Uh, during this time. It's nothing wrong with saying when we've made mistakes and, uh, and I'm okay with doing that. It's about learning and changing and I think it shows leadership to acknowledge when we've been wrong. So thank you for that. Uh, I wanna turn it back over to the majority leader and I wanna thank her for her constant leadership as well. I'm sure she'll speak at some point today whenever she wants, but she has been incredible throughout this as well. And I'm really grateful for her and for her leadership. Thank you so much, Speaker Corey Johnson. And I thank you so much, Public Advocate Jamani Williams for your leadership. And at this time, we will move into discussion of general orders. We will first recognize council members who have signed up by email and then recognize members who wish to speak by using the raise hand function in Zoom.
I will wait until the first listing of those who wish to speak on the discussion of general orders is presented to me. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, as a reminder to all members, please wait to begin your remarks for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that he has begun the countdown clock. The Sergeant at Arms will alert you when your time has expired. Madam Majority Leader, the first three members who have signed up to speak our council members Gibson, Amprey Samuel, and Richards. Thank you. Council member Gibson. Thank you so Starting much. Madam, thank you so much, Madam Majority Leader. Good afternoon, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate, for your commitment and your leadership during this challenging time. Jemani, you have been all across the city and certainly vocal about your own experiences and certainly the sentiments of many New Yorkers, particularly black and brown New Yorkers. So we appreciate your work. And good afternoon to all of my colleagues and to all of those who are watching today. Uh, today is a very important day in our city where the New York City Council will take a very bold step forward in recognizing that a sleeping nation has finally woke up following the horrific murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. While I applaud all of the advocates, activists, allies, and New Yorkers who have stepped up, demanded more, those of us who are tired of being tired, and those who simply have seen far too much and really had enough. I am saddened that we are here today because we've seen another black man killed by police in America. We can't say all lives matter until black lives matter and black trans lives matter. Today, I am proud to sponsor the POST Act, first introduced back in 2017, which will increase the transparency and oversight of the NYPD's use of surveillance technologies and information sharing networks to keep New Yorkers safe. It will require the department to develop and disclose an impact and use policy for each piece of surveillance technology it purchases, as well as new purchases in the future. Uh, we're talking about items such as drones and license plate readers, stingrays, and other measures such as that. And we would get a description of the capabilities, the rules, the processes, and guidelines, and any safeguards and security measures designed to protect the information that has been collected. These measures are important safeguards to protect the civil liberties and privacy rights of New Yorkers in an effort to balance law enforcement and national security concerns with the need for transparency and accountability. We will, as a city of New York, join other cities like San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, Seattle, Detroit, Cambridge, and Nashville in our efforts to know about and understand the surveillance tools that law enforcement uses in our communities. The legislation- I'm expired. This legislation is the floor and not the ceiling. And if I could just acknowledge the advocates who worked really, really hard, Mr. Public Advocate, uh, I really want to thank our former colleague, Dan Gorodnik, who led the way as the original bill sponsor. And I also want to thank the Brennan Center for Justice, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, Urban Justice Center, American Civil Liberties Union, New York Civil Liberties Union, the Legal Aid Society, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the National Lawyers Guild, National Action Network, the Empire State Indivisible, and all of our colleagues who have signed on and added their voices to this very important bill. Today is a real defining moment for us in the history, and I look forward to the bill's passage. Thank you so much to all of my colleagues, and I urge all of you to vote aye on the POST Act. Thank you so much. Thank you for that historical piece of legislation. I'd now like to hear from Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel. Uh, Madam Majority Leader, before um, uh, Council Member Amprey Samuel goes and the other council members, if we could just be sure to give uh, people extra time if they need it to discuss Certainly. these bills. They've worked very hard on them. And I, I want to make sure that no one feels like they didn't have the opportunity to say what they need to say. So if, if you could just be liberal with the amount of time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. And thank Starting you. time. Thank you, Majority Leader Combo, and um, thank you, Speaker Johnson, for um, adding the additional time. On June 18th in 1948, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights adopted its Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And on June 19th, 2018, the United States of America withdrew from the United Nations Human Rights Council. Yesterday, the Human Rights Council heard debates and arguments from leaders ambassadors, high commissioners all around the globe condemning the killings, murders, lynchings 
of countless black people at the hands of police officers and just overall systemic racism in this country. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights said yesterday that it was not enough to condemn racism and police brutality, but that, and this is her quotes, it was also necessary to make amends for centuries of violence and discrimination, including through formal apologies, truth-telling processes, and reparations in various forms. I think it's quite appropriate that on this same day in history, this body, not far from where the United, delegation, United Nations delegation body met, that this body has drafted, discussed, and debated the police reform bills and we finally address head on some real ills in society. And at the same time as the Human Rights Council debates yesterday, our very own state attorney general, Letitia James, was hearing testimony from protesters and demonstrators, all recounting their interactions with police across the city and state while exercising their First Amendment right to freedom of speech and to peaceably assemble and covered under that right is to demonstrate. The city has trampled over the rights time and time again, and we've watched it in videos and saw countless photos of police knocking down, aggressively pushing demonstrators. And we watched in horror when 20-year-old Donia Zayer was violently assaulted by a police officer who used to be assigned to the 73rd precinct in my district. And when we watched the footage, we all noticed badge numbers not being visible. So my bill pre-considered intro 1962A requires uniform officers to make visible their badge number and rank during a protest. And when they cover their badge and interact with an individual who requests to see the number and rank, if not displayed, this action will allow the individual a private right to action in court. This next step is the law and will finally allow average New Yorkers the opportunity to take action and hold officers accountable. This was not made available under the patrol guide because punishment was at the discretion of the boss. And we all know fellow officers find it difficult and challenging to reprimand their brothers and sisters in blue. So we had to step in and force change and eventually force a change in behavior. And I'm about to end. Behavior this is all about changing behavior and shifting a mindset of I am above the law or better yet, the law protects me and not you. A mindset that we have to change. So today we knock down those barriers to freedom. Today we give people back their voice. Today we give people back their power. And today we change the game with rules and new players. And this will allow an injunctive relief by a judge through punitive damages um, based on the gravity. And when agency policies prove ineffective, it's always time to legislate. So again, I thank you, Mr. Speaker and the legislative staff. And I wanna say a special thank you to the woman behind the scene, Kelly Taylor, for your legal sharp mind in helping to make this happen. Although today is a good moment in the council, this is just a first step of many to reform and abolish systemic racism in this city, state, and country. And as we celebrate Juneteenth tomorrow, hopefully this is the start of one day ensuring that when we stand up one day to pledge allegiance to the flag, that last part that says liberty and justice for all will one day truly mean justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel. We will now hear from Council Member Richards. Thank you, Starting Madam. Time. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And I first want to start by thanking the speaker for being an ally in this fight and really giving this committee the flexibility to really address a lot of the systematic issues, even prior to the death of George Floyd. It has been a tricky balance, I must admit. Um, but you know, we know that we're we're here for this moment, and we have to make sure that we are doing everything we can to change the systematic racism that has endured um, within the NYPD in this city for a long time. You know, without struggle, there can be no progress. And the struggle to preserve Black lives from the clutches of brutality in this nation have long been an issue for Black folks for over 400 years. The murder of George Floyd seems to have awakened a broad coalition of 
New Yorkers to the fight that has been raging in communities of color, but had largely gone unnoticed by the rest of the city. And it has inspired national, state, and local lawmakers to take steps that were previously unimaginable. Cut the NYPD budget by a billion dollars. A month ago, you, you have been laughed out of the room. 50A, untouchable until now. Nevertheless, we know what's got us here, and that is the lack of transparency, accountability, and fairness that pervades the New York City Police Department, and it encourages a culture of brutality and abuse. That abuse is the reason we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic where we are fighting for our lives against COVID-19 and officers who are using it as an excuse to throw us to the ground, smack us, tase us, and completely treat us as animals because they know the chances of them facing significant discipline are little to none. My discipline matrix bill intro 1309B is the start to finally reining in the NYPD's wild, wild west disciplinary system. We are creating a standard of fair discipline process to fit the misconduct of officers. There's no reason we should have to wait five years for the NYPD to fire an officer that killed an unarmed black man with a chokehold tactic that was banned decades earlier. Today, we are giving the police department the opportunity to show us that they truly are New York City's finest and that the officers who can't follow the high standard of conduct will no longer be allowed to wield the authority that comes with a badge. This legislation will also bring a newfound sense of fairness to the department. While some officers are targeted for their misconduct, Others with the same infractions are giving a slap on the wrist with, with a nice promotion on the side. Today, the message is simple. Every single police officer should be held at the same standard. Gone are the days of your connections helping get you out of being held accountable. I'm speaking directly to the officers that refuse to uphold the courtesy, professionalism, and respect that we all deserve. The credibility of the NYPD's internal system for disciplining misconduct by officers is non-existent. It is time for us to step in and remind them that they work for all taxpayers and we need them to respect each and every one of us. Lasting trust between communities and the department can only be achieved with a fair and transparent police discipline process. And that's how we make New York City community safer all around. So today we take one small step towards justice with these bills and resolutions. We must use this moment to create everlasting change. The deaths of Sean Bell, my neighbor, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others must not be in vain. Today, our city and country is demanding change like never before, and this council is fulfilling our mandate. May our work continue. I wanna thank you, Mr. Speaker, once again. I wanna thank uh, some other individuals, Daniel Addis, who's been in this struggle for a long time. Uh, my former uh, legislative director, Jordan Gibbons, uh, Casey Addison, uh, uh, Jamani Williams, public advocate, you've stolen a gem from, uh, from us, um, but it is your gain, and I wanna thank her for the work she did while, uh, during the time when she was here in the committee on this bill, Brian Crow, and to my current uh, legislative director, Tiffany Eason. Thank you so much. And thank you to all my colleagues who called and checked in during this difficult time uh, while we shoulder a lot of burden uh, during this difficult time between COVID and police, uh, policing in this country. Thank you all for being allies. Uh, I urge everyone to vote for these bills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much, Council Member Richards. We will now hear from Council Members Lansman, Holden, followed by Barron. Starting time. I can't breathe. As God is my witness, I never want to see another human being cry out, I can't breathe, as their life is choked or squeezed out of them by a police officer. This isn't a radical idea. The NYPD banned chokeholds as a matter of policy nearly three decades ago. But tell that to Anthony Baez. Tell that to Eric Garner. Tell that to the hundreds of New Yorkers who filed chokehold complaints with the Civilian Complaint Review Board in the years after Eric Garner's death. Someone must police the police. It hasn't been the commissioner's office other than Daniel Pantaleo, who was finally fired after five years of unrelenting political pressure, no officer found to have performed a chokehold was sanctioned with anything more 
than a loss of vacation days. It hasn't been the mayor who has used every tool at his disposal to shield lawbreaking officers from scrutiny and accountability. So it will be us, the city council, that polices the police. And we will do so with the most powerful tool at our disposal, the most powerful force in our country, the force of law. It will now be a crime for an officer to perform a chokehold or restrict someone's breathing by sitting, kneeling, or standing on their back or chest in the course of making an arrest. We will no longer rely on internal NYPD policy that has failed so many. It will now be the law. And we will be watching to make sure that our district attorneys enforce this law. Many people are responsible for this day finally coming. Let me thank one person above all else. And that is Gwen Carr, Eric Garner's mother. She marched, she rallied, she testified, she never gave up. Her courage and determination in the face of a parent's worst trauma is mm -hmm. nothing short of heroic. She and all the mothers of the movement are our heroes. Colleagues, I ask you to honor them by voting yes. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Councilmember Lanceman, for your tireless work and dedication and for lifting up Gwen Carr. I'd now like to hear from Council Members Holden, Barron, and Ku. Thank you, Starting Madam time. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader, uh, for the opportunity to speak on my bill, Intro 1354, which will be uh, voted on today. The bill requires all concrete mixing trucks operating in New York City to be equip equipped with shoot shutters or similar devices to prevent the spillage of concrete and materials used in uh, mixed concrete to uh, no later than June 30th, 2021. The idea for this legislation came from multiple constituents and transportation advocates who reached out to my office complaining about concrete mounds on roads, bike lanes, and even sidewalks. Um, and, you know, I looked at, uh, at this uh, for about uh, 20 years as a civic leader and, and figured out how to how do we stop this? And uh, finally, um, we had some suggestions from the industry uh, uh, and uh, talking to other people. So, you know, we traveled around the district and saw several locations, really bad spills. And again, it is a hazard to pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists alike. So intro 1354 is cost neutral legislation, which uh, could actually save the city money because now DOT or sanitation will not have to clean these mounds, uh, which take a, you know, takes time and resources. They have to actually jackhammer um, the, the concrete up. Uh, so my staff and I spoke with, uh, like I said, the industry professionals, the trade unions, and they all agree that this is a problem and all agreed it's a simple, quick fix. So the legislation would mandate that cement mixer trucks have their chutes capped and prevent spillage of cement, which later hardens, of course, like I mentioned, and forms the mounds, the concrete mounds. So I wanna thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson and his staff of, of uh, his chief of staff, Jason Goldman, who has patience with me and because I, I bugged him on this, but uh, this is an important uh, piece of legislation, as well as Jeff Baker and Laura Papa to, uh, for their support on the bill. And also Yudonis Rodriguez, the chair of the transportation committee and Alex Washington for the, uh, the legislative vision who helped draft this bill. And I'd also like to thank DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg and her staff for working with us on this bill. It's rare that both the council and the administration agree on a bill so early on. And her help in finalizing the legislation uh, does not go unnoticed. Finally, I'd like to thank my staff for all the hard work on this uh, over the many, many months including several phone calls from constituents and getting the city agencies to remove these cement mounds. So with that, I urge all my colleagues to support this bill and thank you all who signed on. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Holden. We'll now hear from Council Member Barron, Koo, and Cornegie. Starting time. Councilmember Barron. OK, 
Okay, we will move on to Council Member Koo and come back to Barron. It has not opened up yet. Is it open? Okay. Is it open? We can hear you. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Madam Majority Leader. I want to commend all of my colleagues who have introduced legislation. I think that this is a great response to the push from the people. However, I think that we need to uh, make sure that we catch up to the people if we are the leaders and that we listen to what they're saying and respond. I have one concern about legislation 1309B, and I think that the original bill was one that I could have supported and voted for, but the revision allows for the police commissioner to reject or modify the, the recommendations that will be established by the matrix. We have a police commissioner who does not think that police officers uh, patrol black communities any differently than they do white communities. We have a police commissioner who has given vac loss of vacation days for major and serious crimes. I don't think that we should allow the police commissioner to have the authority to not implement what it is that the matrix has as well established. And it's interesting that they're offering a matrix now, the bill that I will be introducing to establish an elected civilian review board will also include a matrix. And it's finally to talk about allowing officers who kill unarmed civilians to evade investigations by the department and the district attorney as did Lieutenant Shell when he shot Otonzo Bovo in the back in 2008 and was never investigated or charged, even though the death was ruled a homicide, is unbelievable and unacceptable. Shell continued to work. He rose through the ranks. He became an inspector and continued to boost his pension. I don't think that the statute of limitations has expired. And I want to know what actions we can look to take so that we can bring justice to the family of Ortonzo Beauville. So with all due respect, I will not be voting in favor of Bill 1309B. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Koo, Cornegie, and Miller. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader, and thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'd like to speak about these uh, police reform bills and the state of our law enforcement today. I have a very good working relationship with the local police department. Many of them feel the reforms we vote on today will make their jobs more difficult. In the short term, it might. But it's my deepest hope that these reforms will be a long-term solution and help to mend the bonds of trust that have been so deeply fractured between the public and law enforcement. We simply cannot continue on the path we have been. I, for one, do not think we need to abolish the police. We can reform the police, give them more sustained training instead of one-offs, and enough transparency so we can build trust without compromising security. We should not be talking about lately defending the police with no clear objective. But we do need to stop relying on them to do jobs they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Let them focus on fighting crime and shutting quality of life issues. Police should serve as a backup to other enforcement agencies like park enforcement patrols and urban park rangers. But too, often, we, 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 but too often, we rely on them to do their jobs too. So we need to redirect funding to where it needs to go. I hope as our city begins, begins to get back on its feet that these bills will help heal our city. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, Councilmember Koo. We'll now hear from Carnegie and Miller. Starting time. Thank you so much, uh, Majority Leader Combo. Uh, good afternoon. This week in partnership with Billy Holiday Theater, Bed-Stuy Restoration, Artist Dawood West, Say Adams, and Hollis King, um, 
we created a giant Black Lives Matter street mural on Fulton Street. That mural forms part of the expressive awareness raising dimension of Black Lives Matter. We came together as a Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights community. There were Fulton Arts Fair artists, colleagues in government, clergy, and neighborhood residents. No one, absolutely no one who wanted to help us paint those words was turned away. We pitched in together to create something magnificent together. We made a monument to honor the countless named and unnamed who did not live to see this day. Today, the city council advances critical legislation and policy dimensions of Black Lives Matter. Policing must be more transparent. Policing must be more accountable. Policing cannot be about choking and brutalizing the public. Police brutality and murder have no place in policing. I honor all those police who understand the message Black Lives Matter conveys, a message of human dignity for every member of our shared communities, a message that says repression and oppression must give way to equality and equity. We demand structures and systems to advance equity and equality. We have a right to expect systems that advance equality and equity. We will not have peace until we have uplifted equity and equality. I want to honor the transformative power of peaceful protest. I honor all those who urge us to rethink, reimagine, and fundamentally reform our approaches to public safety and to our budget. Today is not the end of the journey, it's a step as we work to recenter our neighborhood organizations, our community health workers, our social workers, our educators, and all our neighborhood institutions. There's an interconnected fabric in our neighborhoods that keeps us safe, and we want police to be a constructive part of that. The legislation we advance today helps us reach towards that end. I wanna congratulate all my colleagues on great legislation being passed. I wanna say how proud I am to be a part of a council that would make this a priority, no matter what the ethnicities are and what the, what the, um, what the makeup is of this 51 member body. To make this a priority makes me incredibly proud. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cornegie. We'll now hear from Council Members Miller, Rodriguez, and Van Bramer. Starting time. Council Member Miller. Madam Majority Leader. Yes. Okay. Uh, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and now Rashad Brooks are tragic figures in the never ending saga of black lives stolen by police. And because of these atrocities committed against them, our city, state, and nation are being confronted with what Dr. King referred to as the fierce urgency of now. Today, among a host of other important legislation, we vote to ban the use of chokehold by the police department which gained notoriety, notoriety in 1994 with the death of Anthony Baez and in 2014 with the death of Everett Garner. Chokeholds and other forms of asphyxiation represent more than unuseful, unlawful police tactics. They are symb symbolic of systematic oppression, torture, murder against generations of Black Americans, past and present. In the shadows of 99, the 99th anniversary of the Black Wall Street Massacre of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the fifth anniversary of Mother Emanuel 9, Charleston, South Carolina, we continue to see these symbols throughout our country and throughout our nation. We see the bodies of three Black men most recently found hanging from trees. And in vacant chambers of City Hall, we see Thomas Jefferson, someone who we believe, who, who, who we know did not treat blacks as equals, but treated them as inferiors and owned more than 700 slaves. With this vote that we take today, we no longer will be delaying, but we'll take a significant step forward in compelling our city to reconcile with the racially motivated brutality and murder of black New Yorkers. But this alone does not represent the justice that we or the families of these stolen lives seek. The fierce sense of urgency and the fierce sense of now that this requires will be addressed and will address the institutional systematic unconscious and conscious racism, both real and symbolic. On behalf of the Black Latino Asian Caucus, I congratulate all of my colleagues 
on this great and thoughtful, impactful legislation. I want to thank the speaker and the public advocate for their leadership on these as well. And I look forward to their passage. Thank you so much, Council Member Miller. Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Van Bramer. Starting time. Councilmember Rodriguez. Let's move to Councilmember Van Bramer and come back to Councilmember Rodriguez. Starting time. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Majority Leader. I just wanted to also uh, say how proud I am to support this legislation in uh, particular. Uh, congratulate Councilmember Lanceman, who uh, worked long and hard on this bill. It should have happened a long time ago, and we all um, uh, are uh, in some part responsible for it not having moved more quickly. Uh, I also just want to say um, the urgency of it uh, and the urgency of, of what Councilmember Barron said about uh, her bill to propose an elected civilian complaint review board, which I wholeheartedly support, is so important. Uh, Justin Errol Lewis's column in the Daily News today, uh, he wrote that even after the murder of Eric Garner, uh, the civilian complaint review board recorded 996 separate civilian complaints of police using chokeholds. And those were just the ones that were reported to the civilian complaint review board. Uh, and having spoken to Council Member Barron, um, we both know how difficult it is to get any kind of justice through the Civilian Complaint Review Board um, and have anything substantiated. So uh, these bills are great. I congratulate all of my colleagues, uh, but I know that this is just the beginning in so many ways. This is just the beginning. We have so much more to do. We need radical transformative change um, and uh, of course I support uh, defunding the NYPD, which is part of that, but uh, we've got to actually take this moment to reimagine our society and make sure that the urgency of this moment is not lost uh, or frittered away. Uh, so I encourage all of us um, to be as bold as we possibly can imagine being as we uh, work to dismantle uh, the systemic and structural racism throughout our our society. So with that, I just want to congratulate again my colleagues uh, and lift up Councilmember Barron. Uh, look forward to her introducing that legislation and moving it and seeing it passed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. It's Councilmember Rodriguez uh, here at this time. Okay, we will move to Councilmembers Rose followed by Council Member Menchaca. Starting time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, this afternoon, I stand before you to say that I am not okay. I am not okay that the arc of justice is fractured. I am not okay relegating my whole life to a hashtag. And I am not okay that the new Black national anthem is, I can't breathe. Today's stated for me is one of the most significant in, the, in my tenure on the city council. Nearly six years ago, we heard Eric Garner say to the police officers when they approached him, this ends today. Little did he know that it meant his life was going to end that day. But before pleading with New York City police officers Eric Garner wound up saying, I can't breathe 11 times as he was pressed to the hot pavement outside of a store in my district after being put into a chokehold. And nearly six years ago, Councilmember Lanceman introduced a bill that made deadly chokeholds illegal. 
But yet, we now find ourselves having witnessed another death of a son that could have been mine. George Floyd, six years later, Rev, um, Council Member Lanceman introduced his bill that would make deadly chokeholds illegal. The overdue passage of this legislation today is very personal for me and my constituents and for Gwen Carr, who witnessed her son's death. We still hear the echoes of Eric Garner's voice reverberating, I can't breathe the direct result of Officer Pantaleo's deadly chokehold as we watched once again this scenario played out in the death of George Floyd. Mr. Garnett's death proved that it is not enough that the NYPD prohibits this practice. And history has shown us that violations of the New York City Police Department rules too often result in little or no discipline of officers. So six years today, we say again, this ends today. And so I wanna thank my colleagues for this package of bills that makes real tangible changes in policing in New York City. And I hope that we will set the example for the rest of the country. I want to thank the speaker for bringing these bills to the floor and all the sponsors for their leadership and persistence in moving these bills forward and us closer to a more equitable justice system. Thank you. And I support these bills. Thank you so much, Council Member Rose. And we will now hear from Council Member Manchaka. Thank you, Majority Leader. Starting time. And I, I just want to say thank you for all those who have spoken before me and lift up those voices in the council that have been fighting for such a long time, even longer than I have been in the council. Uh, thank you to Speaker Johnson and Public Advocate Williams and Chair Richards and Councilmember Gibson and Amphrey Samuel, Lanceman, Cabrera, Rivera, all my colleagues. The, the bills that were voted on today are, are good bills and they're a step in the right direction. I want to also celebrate and honor in the record uh, today's decision in the Supreme Court this morning, which upheld the, the, the DACA arrivals. Uh, this is a moral and legal victory for over 50,000 New Yorkers, of which 9,200 are essential workers, including 1,200 healthcare workers. But the fight continues, and until Congress abolishes ICE and transforms our immigration system, we will never stop this nation's inhumane history of separating families and ruining lives. The system is broken and we're trying to fix it. And these bills that we're passing today are getting us closer. I wanna echo something that public advocate William said, uh, which is that we must never lose sight of the ultimate goal, our ultimate goal with these reforms, which is to completely transform the way that we conceive of public safety and deliver justice to the most vulnerable. That is the ultimate goal. And so until, until we start investing heavily in social services and stop investing in police and jails and persecution, we will never, never undermine the foundations of the prison industrial complex, which includes the immigration system and, and, and is structurally supporting the oppressive and unjust systems that we're talking about today. And finally, I wanna say thank you to Councilmember Barron. She was the only vote against the police additions in 2015, and I voted yes on that bill. And I was wrong and I was wrong. And I want to say thank you to her. Um, it was that cur courage. It was that courage and that listening and that relationship that we have created together over these years. We have sat and talked together a lot. They got me to the Rikers vote um, against the Rikers plan. And so Councilmember Member Barron, thank you so much for your courage. Let's continue to do this together. See you weather. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Manchaca. And I will try to give Councilmember Rodriguez one last try if he's able to uh, unmute himself. Starting time. Hi. I, I think that, you know, as I say at uh, the Public Safety Committee, this is a day that we never thought that we would be. 
those of us that have been marching for justice for Juan Rodriguez, a Dominican brother that was killed in Brooklyn, when the NYPD throw the horses to those of us, December 12th, Richie, Howard Jordan, Dominicans, Juan Rodriguez was killed because he forgot to take the medicine. The Leona Bumper case, we were there, Anthony Weiss. So for me, as someone that in my around 15 arrests that I have had on civil disobedience, I can share with my fellow New Yorkers that when I was arrested, they occupied Wall Street. I fear for my life a few seconds. I fear the pressure losing air. When I was arrested, trying to stop Robbie to be deported, they used shock holder on me too. So I'm not yes having compassion. I have lived it. 1989, I was arrested after learning my constitutional right. When I say that I have my right to be using my foreign amendment, I was told, you don't have any right if Dominicans. Well, today's a new day. I never thought serving on the council for my first four years where there's one not any spirit to police reform. That after council member Gibson and Richard using the leadership with the support of the speaker, we will be seeing today the level of reform that we're doing. And as I said, my brother was a police officer at the 42nd. I'm proud to see Chief Pichardo also at the NYPD. I lost, I, I'm sorry for the loss of Chief Morris, who also did a great job. But at the same time, when I signed to be a teacher and I took for 13 years, I knew that job that I wanted to do. There's an opportunity for the men and women who want to dress blue work around this reform. If anyone is not ready to work with the reform that we're making, get another job. We can have, we can, we have the opportunity to be a city that will be a role model for the whole nation. We can build NYPD that do a new type of police, policing our community based on respect, where the community is sitting with the respect that they deserve and they also should get, give the respect to the community. No anyone had the confidence to have a gun. So I believe that, you know, with the bills that we're voting, again, my daughter, seven and 13, they will see a new beginning. This is only a beginning. A police department in any countries have been built to suppress. I think that we can build a new type of police department in the city of New York that can be a role model to the whole nation. I support this bill. They are important. They strengthen, strengthen the relationship between the community and the police. I'm also happy to see how Speaker Johnson and all of those have been able to move this bill regardless of any opposition. There's no time for bullying from those of us that have any opposition to this bill. The, most of the New Yorkers want this bill. I'm proud to be voting on this bill. And I thank the chair, uh, Richard, and previous chair Gibson and a speaker in a uh, Corey Johnson and a speaker Melissa Marbury for the job that we do, we bring a reform to this. With that, I'm proud to be voting aye when the time comes. Thank you so much, Council Member Rodriguez, and thank you to all of the members um, who have spoken today on general orders. We will now move into the report of special committees. None. Reports of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Public Safety, Intro 487A, Police Surveillance Technologies. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intros 536B and 721B, Chokeholds and Recording Police Activities. Amended and coupled on general orders. Intro 760B and 1309B, Early Intervention System and Disciplinary Matrix. Amended and coupled on general orders. Preconsidered intro 1962A, requiring visible shield numbers. Amended and coupled of general orders. Report of the Committee on Transportation, intro 1354A, concrete truck spillage prevention. Amended and coupled on general orders. And at this time, I would ask that the clerk please take a roll call vote 
on all of the items on today's general order calendar that we are voting on and that we just discussed. Cabrera. I vote aye on all. Adam. So proud to be a uh, sponsor and sign on to every last piece of legislation today. Uh, so proud of my colleagues for their courage, their strength, and their leadership. Thank you to all of my colleagues that have waited all these years, all these years for this change to come. And it starts here with this New York City Council. Congratulations to all of you. I vote aye on all. And Bree Samuel. I vote aye on all. Ayala. Ayala. Baron. Council Member Baron. Mission to explain my vote. Mission granted. Thank you. Once again, I want to commend my colleagues for the legislation that they've introduced. And it perhaps gives some sense of. Um, perhaps gives some sense of closure to the families of Anne Baez killed in 1994, or Michael Arthur Miller killed by a chokehold in 1978, and uh, Michael Stewart killed by a chokehold in 1983. So other families, as we've heard, perhaps have not even, have not even reported those incidents. But I do want to commend uh, all of my colleagues for the legislation they have presented. And I'm voting in the affirmative with all, with the exception of 1309B. Once again, we're looking to empower an elected civilian review board. And that board will have three main tenets. One is that all of the members are elected. Secondly, that the review that the elected civilian review board will have the authority to determine what it is that the disciplinary action should be administered, and the commissioner cannot change what it is that their decision is. And thirdly, that there be an independent, not special, not special who relates to other executive positions, an independent prosecutor. prosecutor who will adjudicate those cases that rise to the level of a crime because we have not gotten any results of an effective prosecution by the present special prosecutor who uses ex-police for their investigations. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Borelli. Thank you, and uh, Madam Majority Leader, please forgive me for not being on camera. I am at the graduation of my son, uh, so I want to congratulate him for the record for graduating preschool. Uh, I am voting no on all except uh, intro 1309B and 1354A. Again, that is no on all except 1309B and 1354A. Thank you. Brennan. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Uh, with deep gratitude um, for the leadership of my colleagues in the BLAC, I proudly vote aye on all. Thank you. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you, Majority Leader. You know, first I wanted to uh, thank all the colleagues who sponsor important legislation. And I really want to express my gratitude uh, to my black colleague in the city council, especially in the BLAC caucus and the women's caucus for really stepping up in their leadership to push forward this package of bills to fight against police brutality and systematic racism. It took a lot of courage and you know, going through this pandemic, but they found the courage and the stamina and with the leadership hours from our speaker and his support, we're able to get to this point and all the allies in the council 
and all the people who've been demonstrating on the street. I have been a strong ally in the city council from the beginning. You know, we fought against stop and frisk. We, we stood together for the Right to Know Act and we stood together to fight for justice for Eric Garner. But this is not enough. We gotta continue to fight. And when we say Black Lives Matter, we gotta turn those words into action and to continue to make sure there's social justice, there's economic justice, and an equitable budget, equitable budget this year. Yeah, uh, sure Andrea, let me call you right back in a few minutes. Are taking care of our youth, our seniors, our safety net program. So I wanna ask all my colleagues, let's strong, stand strong together and make sure that we have a strong equitable budget too. So I am proud to vote I on all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member Chen. Cohen. Aye. Constantinidis. Aye on all. Carnegie. I proudly vote aye on all. Deutsch. Permission to explain my vote. Permission to explain my vote. Madam Majority Leader. I think we lost her. Mr. Speaker. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm permission granted. So I want to start by saying that not only do I understand calls for police reform, but I actually agree with them. We need to do something to challenge uh, the change, uh, to change the culture that allowed a man to kneel uh, on another man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I wanna see a true reform, and that means investment in our youth services and communities of color. It means working hand in hand with the police department to identify where there is a need for enhancing training, for enhanced training. And it means working from the bottom up to rebuild the broken relationship between minorities and police officers. I have real issues with some of the bills in this package of legislation. Uh, first intro 487, the Post Act. It's no secret that the NYPD has expressed grave concern with, the, with this legislation, concerns that I echo. The real life effects of this bill can endanger the lives of undercover police officers, particularly those who are fighting terrorism. In this city, that experienced the most terrorist attack on U.S. soil. We must not take any steps to undermine law enforcement's ability to identify and apprehend terrorists. So I vote no on intro 487. Second, intro 536, banning chokeholds. While I strongly agree with, this, uh, with the intent of this bill, there are serious issues with some of the bill's language, which would essentially criminalize a police officer's behavior uh, if they take steps to subdue a prisoner as they attempt to make an arrest. For the record, I will be voting yes on intro, on intro 536 because I agree with the intent, but I have real problems with the consequences of this bill. Uh, how can we ask the NYPD officers to keep the peace and maintain law and order in this city, but they can have also, they have to also be afraid of being prosecuted for reasonable actions that they take in the course of their job. I will also be voting yes on the other pieces of legislation in this package, but I just wanna add that I uh, challenge the idea that these bills are genuine uh, police reform. Many of our elected officials are contributing to a climate of divisiveness in this city by affirming that New Yorkers should view police as the enemy. Each of us have dealt with police, uh, with police on a personal level. And yes, they are bad apples, of course. And those individuals need to be retrained and disciplined where appropriate. But we are, now, we are not helping anyone by, dismir by dismir dismirching 36,000 of our fellow New Yorkers and promoting distrust of law enforcement throughout the city. If we really want to reform policing in New York City, and I do, then let's work in concert with all the stakeholders. Thank you. Diaz. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Drum. Council Member Drum. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't see him listed. Okay. Council Member Eugene. Uh, I would, yes, sir. Thank you. Gibson. Permission to explain? Permission granted. Okay, thank you so much. And again, I want to commend our speaker, Corey, for your leadership and your commitment during this challenging time and certainly allowing the BLAC, the Women's Caucus, and those council members whose districts have been really affected by a lot of the issues we're talking about. I thank you for allowing us a chance to really talk about these issues and, and really carry a leadership role. Um, I did want to add on to my previous comments and just recognizing that the post act legislation is literally the floor and it's not the ceiling. And it's a basic reporting bill that will create a foundation of information on technology and surveillance that is used by the department. Um, and all of the advocates who worked so hard, I give them so much credit and admiration for this moment in history because they have been committed and consistent from the very beginning. And I truly believe like all of my colleagues do that this is really a defining moment for us in the city of New York. We have an opportunity to set a tone, to make a difference and show our young people something better than they have been shown. To show them that they should not be treated nor judged by the color of their skin but who they are as God's children. That is all of our responsibility, the NYPD, the city council and all New Yorkers. And, and simply put, recognizing that we've been dealing with two pandemics in this society, COVID-19 and 401 years of systemic racism. We have to do better and we must do better. And so I thank all of you because we are here for a time, a reason and a season. And the work we do as legislators will have a profound next generation of leaders. Uh, and so I thank all of you to all of my colleagues and all of the advocates and all New Yorkers out there who sometimes feel like nothing is happening and feel like giving up. Continue to stand in your purpose and know that you have a role to play. You don't need a title in front of your name to care about your neighbor and your community, but we need everyone's help. Um, and so with that, Mr. Speaker, Madam Majority Leader, our public advocate, I want to commend all of the sponsors of all the bills today and really the legislative division who've worked endless hours through your labor of love to see these bills through. Thank you very much. And to all the young people, we do this work for you. I vote aye on all items on today's agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Joan I. I am all. Gordenchik. I and all. Holden. Permission to briefly explain my vote? Permission granted. Uh, upholding public safety is one of the highest priorities of an elected official. While we should always be open to logical reforms, uh, we also must weigh public safety and recognize the extremely tough jobs our police officers have. Uh, I believe two of these bills, the way they are written, will hinder police officers when they are put in situations where they have to make quick life-saving decisions. And that will ultimately make our city less safe. So with that, I vote no on intros 487A and 536B and I on the rest. Thank you. Kalos. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Congratulations to all of the bill sponsors. I ran for office inspired by elected officials like Jamani Williams, who originally authored the Right to Know Act. As council members, this is what we are here to do. I am a sponsor of every bill in this package of legislation that will take another step towards reforming the NYPD. I wanna thank you to those who have taken to the streets and the 100,000 residents who have emailed demanding that we defund the NYPD and bring meaningful police reform. This vote is for all of you. I proudly vote aye on all. This is a first step. The budget is a next step and we have much more to do. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me. 
House Member King. Uh, permission to briefly explain my vote. Permission granted. Thank you, Madam Combo. Um, I just want to echo the words of Haim Dersh, uh, INS Barron, and Holden. Um, I have family and friends who are on the force, and I know what they experience each and every day. Uh, and I say to them who get it right, kudos. For those who get it wrong, then they shouldn't be police officers anymore. I'm not sure if all this legislation gets us to that place because everybody can't be a teacher, shouldn't teach, and can't be a police officer, shouldn't be a police officer. But we want to continue to make our, our communities and our cities safe. So with that all being said, I reluctantly vote aye on all, uh, but I'm hoping that we can do better as a city when it comes to public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Council member Koo. I don't know. Thank you. Kozlowitz. I say enough is enough. I proudly vote aye. Lanceman. Yes. Lander. Request permission to explain. Permission granted. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. I want to honor the hard work of all the sponsors and advocates who have worked to get today's legislation to the floor. And I want to take a moment to especially acknowledge our Black colleagues for your leadership and your honesty, even when it is really painful. I've been thinking in recent weeks about something I learned from Trevor Noah about what Amy Cooper revealed when she made that phone call in Central Park, putting Christian Cooper's life in danger. She revealed that she knew that the state power of weaponized racism could be called down at any moment, that these aren't isolated incidents, but that they exist in a systemic way, like they're in the air all the time. And that's not only true in policing, but when you go to rent or buy a home or seek a job or take your kids to school, how could you be okay? Uh, how could any of us? So it should not have taken a popular uprising for the city council to make chokeholds a crime or require a standard disciplinary matrix for the NYPD or make hiding a badge number illegal or demand basic transparency about NYPD surveillance technology. Um, but I'm glad that we are voting to do all of those today and I support all those bills. Now, I wish I believed these bills would restore some measure of trust between the NYPD and the communities that they are supposed to protect and serve. But at the hearing on these bills, NYPD representatives made clear they had no understanding of what is required to rise to this moment. And they did not even stay to hear the testimony of so many New Yorkers who came just to speak about the violence that they had experienced at the hands of officers and just asked to be heard. And I have to note that even now, literally while we are voting to pass these bills, and even after the mayor has indicated that he's going to sign it, the NYPD's official account on Twitter is opposing the Post Act with the same fear mongering that they've been using to delay the bill for the past three years. I cannot remember a city agency running a rogue policy advocacy operation at any point in time, much less during a city council meeting, much less at this moment in our city and our nation's history. So I have to say, sadly, it's impossible for me to have confidence that any measure of trust is going to be restored here. So we'll be back here next week and following advocates, including Communities United for Police Reform, will need to cut at least $1 billion from the NYPD budget to invest in our communities. And then we'll move forward, we'll need to move forward to more fundamentally reinvent how we achieve public safety in our city and to confront the systemic racism that we know pervades our schools and our economy and our housing market and our healthcare system and so many other domains. I vote aye on all with the exception of intro 1354 on which I abstain. Levin. Um, permission to explain my vote. Permission granted. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Um, I want to thank um, the sponsors of these bills. I want to uh, thank and acknowledge um, Councilmember Donovan Richards, our Chair of Public Safety. Um, I want to um, acknowledge um, the members of the Black Latino Asian Caucus in the Council um, for their leadership 
and their um, diligent work on this. Um, Council Member Lanceman, Council Member Gibson, and the speaker and the staff that worked on this. Um, I, I agree and concur with my colleagues. Um, this is um, overdue. Um, and it, it marks a small um, indication of the immense amount of work that we need to continue to do. Today is not the end of that work. Um, we should not think of it as such. Um, we have to rise to this moment in history because that is what um, is required of us. And that is what the people that we represent are asking us to do and are calling on us to do. And um, that's gonna be, that's gonna require a lot of, of difficult work. It's gonna require a lot of, a lot more votes like this today. Um, and it's gonna require um, a real fortitude, um, but the moment demands nothing less than that. And, um, and so I encourage, all everybody that's out there marching to continue to march, um, continue to hold us accountable and um, and push for greater accountability in your government um, and and a greater um, effort towards justice. And, and I also just want to acknowledge um, uh, all the family members uh, of people who um, were killed at the hands of the NYPD, Gwen Carr, Mothers of the Movement, and everybody um, else who has um, I worked so tired to say, I just wanna especially acknowledge Nicholas Hayward, who passed away last year, um, who, who dedicated um, half of his life um, to um, police accountability when his son was murdered um, 25 years ago. Um, and, and so, my vote is in honor of, of, of Nicholas Hayward, and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Council Member Drum. Madam Chair, I leave the commission. I'd like to vote. I had to step away for a moment. Permission granted. Thank you. I vote aye on all today. Thank you. Thank you. Levine. Well, thank you so much, Madam Majority Leader, with deep appreciation to the sponsors who worked years towards passage of these bills and with gratitude for the leadership of the BLAC today throughout this crisis and beyond, I will proudly be voting aye on all. Thank you. Lewis. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you. Uh, I proudly vote aye on all, and I just want to thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your commitment and your consistency and for being an ally to Black and Brown leaders um, seeking to make change in the community and the system. And I just want to applaud all of the bill sponsors um, and my colleagues for pushing forward these bills. I think it's really sad and disgraceful that we have to have these conversations and that we have to debate if Black and Brown people's lives really matter. Um, and if we have to debate if it's okay for us to live and for us to breathe, um, I think it's really sad and disgraceful that we have to have a conversation about how Black and people are treated by law enforcement, um, how we're treated inhumanely and like animals. Um, but what I'm happy about is that the actions that are being taken place today and moving forward in the future would ensure the families of Akai Gurley, Sean Bell, um, Eric Garner, and so many other people who, who were killed by police officers, we, we're ensuring that they know that we're speaking up for them and that the system will become equitable and more transparent due to the actions today and moving forward. So pr probably voting aye on all and just wanna thank all my colleagues for being strong and for pushing forward. Thank you. Thank you. Myself.
Councilman Mizell, I think you're muted. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Menchaca. I want to dedicate my vote to all the protesters, the marchers, the agitators. Keep doing your work. Keep marching. We're listening to you. We're going to keep doing more if you stay loud. I vote I know. Miller. Uh, permission to explain, Madam Public Advocate. I'm sorry, did I say that? Uh, Madam Majority Leader. Yes, you're so prophetic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Madam Majority Leader. So um, my Muslim faith or someone's affiliation with Black Lives Matter or the Black Panther movement should not arbitrarily subject them to some random, un illicit and, and untransparent surveillance by the NYPD, um, but it has. And so we, we as uh, Council Member Gibson said, the post act is merely the floor. Something has to get done. And so um, we are, I'm very proud to support this legislation and I am dedicating uh, my vote um, to my good friend, Lois, at the age of, of 14, uh, to the hands of police officer Robert Torsney in 1975, um, Randolph Ezen, Evans. I proudly vote I on all. Thank you. And sorry for your loss. Moya. I vote I on all. Perkins. Council Member Perkins, can you unmute yourself? You okay? Say yes. No problem. How do you vote, Council Member Perkins? I vote aye. Thank you. Powers. I vote aye. Uh, congratulations to all my colleagues who worked very hard and, uh, on these bills and uh, to all my colleagues in the BLAC who I know worked very hard on these. And both congratulations to my colleague Vanessa Gibson, but I also wanted she noted, I want to thank my predecessor Dan Garonic for his work on the Post Act, which uh, I know lots of folks have been working on to get it done. So I want to say congratulations to them as well. I vote aye. Thank you. Reynoso. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you, Majority Leader. I just want to uh, say thank you to all the bill sponsors uh, and the work that we've done in, in just uh, holding the line for so many years so that we could see uh, some semblance of, of justice and just a, a sensible reaction to what's happening in our, in our city. Uh, long before George Floyd uh, was murdered. Uh, I hope that moving forward, the city council can have the same urgency related to issues of education, health, transportation, uh, and education um, to start bringing justice to a lot of this uh, infrastructure that exists in our city that has made it so that black and brown lives are devalued. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having continuing those conversations as well and that, uh, and I vote I on all. Thank you. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. I want to congratulate once again, all the bill sponsors. We still have a lot more work to do. Uh, this is a lifetime struggle. Won't end with this council, just like it didn't begin with this council. Uh, and I happily vote I on all. Thank you. Thank you. Rivera. Many thanks and congratulations to my colleagues and everyone else out there who made this happen. I probably vote aye on all. Thank you. Rodriguez. Yes. Uh, look, as I said before, give me one second. As I said before, I think that, you know, the, all, the whole body of this council can be so proud, but we always have to give credit to the advocate 
those who march, those who even break the curfew that was established, who took the street. Without that movement, we would not be here today. I know that for many of us who are elected, but by heart, we are progressive. I know when I see from here the face of Council Member Drum, when I see the many faces, you know, people that we've been arrested, that we've been part, you know, of protesting against police brutality, I know that we are so, we can be so proud because Danny, you know, those of us who started together from 2009, we know what was going on in the Criminal Justice Committee. We know what was going on when we visited Rikers Island and there was completely opposition from the speaker to the mayor. There was no space to have this conversation. I know that when we marched together in all those cases, when we got arrested two together in many occasions, we never thought that the council would be voting this reform that we're doing today. But let's dedicate it to the life of those loved ones that we lost. Let's dedicate it to those who their family also been crying. We cannot bring the body back, but we can continue fighting for justice on their name. Everyone who are marched, regardless if some people sometimes, you know, those of us elected, sometimes we don't have to agree on everything. Let's give credit. Vamos a darle crédito a todo el mundo. Los inmigrantes que han luchado, las madres que han perdido sus seres queridos, la gente que han dicho basta ya, los policías tenemos que protegerlos con los recursos que ellos necesitan, pero no dándole de más. Tenemos que protegerlos para que hagan su trabajo, pero entendiendo que un revólver no lo hace más hombre o más mujer a nadie. Que podemos crear un departamento de policía que puede ser un ejemplo para la nación de una confianza entre la policía mirando a la comunidad con respeto. Los niños que están en la calle nuestros no son drogaditos, no están vendiendo droga, no tienen lugares deportivos como tienen los ricos. Entonces tenemos esa oportunidad nosotros, la estamos haciendo ahora. Very proud to be voting yeah, I, in this bill and very proud of the 51 council member that I is voting for this bill and especially to the advocate community. Si se puede, sigamos luchando por la justicia social. With that, I will add. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. Rose. Um, I, permission to explain my vote. I And I just want to thank, I want to thank the protesters for their persistence, for their energy, and for being the catalyst that got us to this point. And I want to thank my colleagues for standing firm and in the face of injustice and saying that this the silence about injustice ends today, and I vote aye on all. Thank you. Rosenthal. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. I want to congratulate and express gratitude to my colleagues for their legislation and leadership during these challenging times. The bill sponsors and staff have done a remarkable job. And thank you, Speaker Johnson, for moving this legislation to the floor for our vote. And I am proud to vote aye on all. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, the city council has led the way with thoughtful legislation and policy suggestions. Council members Danique Miller and Adrian Adams have shown real leadership as co-chairs of the BLAC. Council member Donovan Richards has held the NYPD's feet to the fire as chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I am proud to be an ally of my black colleagues in the council and I'm listening to what they are saying and particularly want to thank council members Ambry Samuels, Adams, Barron, Gibson, Lewis, Rose, and Majority Leader Combo for their wisdom. And lastly, I want to send a message to the mayor. Passing the fiscal year 21 budget is around the corner. Be clear, defunding the NYPD is imperative, whether that be by moving responsibilities to other agencies or decreasing the size of the force. And funding for youth, seniors, and social services must be maintained. Replacing 75,000 summer youth employment slots with 3,300 is unacceptable. 
Cutting social service contracts to save government jobs is nonsensical. Reductions to your social senior service contracts for meals has already resulted in layoffs. Your proposed budget is adding to the city's unemployment rolls. I am proud to serve with this council that fights for justice and equity through legislation and the budget. Thank you. Thank Salamanca. you, Councilman. Yes. Sorry, Councilman. No problem. I don't know. Thank you. Torres. I don't know. Traeger. I. Ulrich. Uh, good afternoon. I'm voting I don't know with the exception of two intros, intro 487A and 1309B. I'm voting no on those two bills but I'm voting aye on all the rest. And um, I am wishing all my fellow dads out there a very happy Father's Day. And uh, to all my colleagues who are passing all the other pieces of legislation, congratulations and uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Malone. Permission to explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And to our leader, Speaker Johnson. Uh, during these profoundly painful times for all of us, our city council once again has stepped up to lead. The emotional anguish and trauma sparked by the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis has spurred demonstrations that continue today. Here in New York City, after the death of Eric Garner in 2014, we as a council stood with our NYPD to usher in reform and bring community policing to our five boroughs. These are changes and reforms that other large cities have still yet to implement. Now today, once again, our council is leading the way. While I completely agree with today's ban on the use of chokeholds in New York City, we must always remember that our offices can be placed in deadly situations. That is why I and others have requested one amendment, the right to defend your life and include a life-threatening exclusion, the very same exclusion that exists within federal and state laws. This request was denied. It remains my hope that the sponsor of today's bill sees the right path and includes this amendment in the near future. I want to personally thank my fellow council members who have shared their personal and emotional stories with myself and this body. These conversations were heartfelt and shaped from our individual life experiences and allowed each of us to share, learn, and perhaps understand pieces of our personal stories. This is how we will go forward. And this is the compassionate and strong leadership that is represented today in these historic policy changes. My dad taught me long ago that we must always listen and implement changes for the common good of all people. These bills today show that in our time of anguish, we listen and that change is coming today. Happy Father's to everyone. God bless everyone. And thank you for the time. I vote aye on all. Thank you, Councilmember Vallone. Van Bramer. Permission to briefly explain my vote? Permission granted. Thank you very much. Um, first, I, I too wanna um, echo what uh, I believe Councilor Menchak has said before, uh, Councilmember Barron, uh, was the one who had the courage to vote uh, against us uh, putting all that money in for extra police officers years ago. Uh, and she was right then uh, and I was wrong. And I wanna say that as well. Um, and over the last uh, two and a half years, uh, Councilmember Barron often gets up and speaks uh, at the end of the meetings. And uh, I listen to every word she says and I have to say, uh, uh, I've learned an awful lot and appreciate uh, so much uh, of, of the truths that she speaks, uh, uh, truths that people like me need to hear, uh, and we need to finally act on it. Um, uh, you know, white folks can't just keep saying, it's a shame that happens. It's a shame that happened. Uh, we've got to use our privilege and our power um, to actually uh, create systemic 
uh, and fundamental change in our society. Um, so thank you, Councilmember Barron, uh, for uh, for being there. And I also want to thank the the protesters. I've I've marched in uh, four uh, uh, Black Lives Matters marches myself, um, and uh, choose to march towards the back because uh, the young people and the young people of color are leading and should be leading. Um, and, uh, and I don't speak at any of them. Uh, I listen and I march. And uh, I started as a young uh, queer activist who was arrested several times for civil disobedience. Uh, and uh, I'm th enthralled by their activism. I really am. And I just wanna tell them to keep going because the pressure works on elected officials. Keep putting pressure on us keep emailing, keep phone calling, keep marching, because it is pushing this city council to the left and to do the right thing. So do not stop, do not let up. Don't tell Governor Cuomo that it's done and just go home. Uh, it's just starting, the revolution is just starting. Keep going uh, and you will force us uh, to do the right thing. Thank you. With that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Jaeger. Vote aye on all with the exception of introduction 721 and introduction 487. Thank you. Matteo. I'm voting no on 487, 536, 721, 760, and 1962, and I and the rest. Combo. I pro proudly vote aye on all, and this is certainly the proudest day of my life as a city council member. And I wanna thank all of my colleagues who dug deep and found the courage to vote in support of this package of legislation. We thank you, our ancestors thank you, and hopefully our sons and daughters moving forward into the future will truly know what justice, equality, and fairness is. I proudly vote aye on all items. Speaker Johnson. Before I uh, vote <clears throat> aye on all, I just wanna thank all of uh, my colleagues for this uh, very moving stated today to hear from so many members from the BLAC. And uh, I have learned a tremendous amount over the last uh, many weeks and months and I'm really grateful for their uh, friendship and, and uh, for being colleagues and for being able to do some of this work together. And um, I have uh, really tried to listen um, and make sure that we are hearing voices, especially from our black colleagues uh, who we have to really lift up and elevate uh, right now. So I'm really grateful to all of them. I wanna mention one thing that I was remiss in not mentioning at the beginning during the speaker's time. But before I say what it is, I just wanna give a big thanks to council member Inez Barron. I wanna give a big thanks to council member Debbie Rose. I wanna give a big thanks to uh, the co-chairs of the Black, Latino and Asian Caucus, council members uh, I, Danique Miller and Adrian Adams. I wanna give a big thanks to our public safety chair, Donovan Richards, and I could thank all of the members from the BLAC, but I wanted to highlight those four individuals today because uh, they have been pushing for years, literally for years, and it predates, I believe, even Councilor Barron being in the council when it was her uh, husband, who was her predecessor, Councilmember Charles Barron. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize, who was pushing for the statue of Thomas Jefferson to be removed uh, from the city council chambers. And tomorrow marks Juneteenth. And so uh, some of the members that I just mentioned, all of the members that I just mentioned, led by the Black Latino Asian Caucus in the last week, Councilmember Debbie Rose has been one of the fiercest and loudest voices on this. Over the last many years, it has consistently been council member Inez Barron, and again, preceding that was her husband, Assembly Member Charles Barron, former council member. So I just wanted to say today that the city council is sending a letter to the mayor and to the Public Design Commission 
requesting that that statue be removed from the city council chambers. And this is not because of me. This is because of uh, our colleagues. I am happy to support them and will, of course, sign on to that letter. Uh, we can't unilaterally do it on our own, or we would. Uh, we need the Public Design Commission, uh, which the mayor has control over, to green light that. And so we are ready to move that statue out of the chambers as quickly as they'll facilitate making that happen. So I really want to thank Councilmember Barron. I really want to thank Councilmember Rose. And I really want to thank the co-chairs of the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, Council Members Danique Miller and Adrian Adams, not just on this issue, but I'll tell you that the co-chairs of the caucus have been leading on so many issues, even pre-George Floyd being murdered. They were leading on issues related to COVID-19 and the inequities. They were leading on issues around restoring youth programming before it became a big thing in the press. Debbie Rose has spent literally hundreds of hours the last few months working on this issue, uh, meeting with advocates. So I am just so grateful for their leadership and for their advocacy. And uh, I'm grateful to be able to work with them and uh, support them in making these important changes and moves right now. So I know we're gonna have general discussion I didn't mean to leave this to the end. I honestly just forgot because there's so much going on today, but I'm sure people are going to want to speak about this in uh, general discussion and I look forward to hearing about it. And again, I want to thank my colleagues. And with that, Madam Majority Leader, I vote aye on all. And I want to thank you, Madam Majority Leader. I apologize. I'm very sorry. Uh, you have been on this issue as well the last few weeks, ringing the bell on this, talking about this on this issue. Uh, so I am tremendously grateful for your leadership that you have consistently shown throughout this entire time and even before uh, these uh, painful but necessary days that we're in. So thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo. I vote aye and I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Speaker Corey Johnson. And we will now um, hear the results of today's vote on the general orders calendar. The vote on today's general order calendars is, is as follows. Introduction 487A has 44 in the affirmative, six in the negative, no abstentions. Introduction 536A, 47 in the affirmative, three in the negative, no abstentions. Introduction 721A, 47 in the affirmative, three in the negative, zero abstentions. Introduction 760B, 48 in the affirmative, two in the negative, no abstentions. Introduction 1309B, 48 in the affirmative, two in the negative, zero abstentions. Preconsidered introduction 1962A, 48 in the affirmative, two in the negative, zero abstentions. And introduction 1354A, 49 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, one abstention. Thank you so much, Billy Martin, for reading this very historical uh, vote today. And we now will have at this particular time, the items on today's general orders calendar are adopted today. And we will now have the introduction and reading of bills. One moment, Madam Majority Leader. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you. We will now move into the discussion of resolutions. As a reminder, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms begins the countdown clock before you begin your remarks. Madam Majority Leader, Council Member Rivera would like to speak on the resolution. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Starting time. Thank you, uh, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues. I'm very proud of this body today that after debate and discussion, we voted to pass Council Member Lantzman's bill to ban chokeholds here in New York City. Chokeholds and other violent uses of excessive force that have been used by police to kill so many black and brown people had no place in New York City, and they have no place anywhere in this country. 
I ask for that same support from my resolution calling for the passage of the Eric Garner Excessive Use of Force Prevention Act of 2019, which would ban chokeholds at the national level. This bill is an important step in changing the way we think about public safety and policing in America, as the other bills voted on today help us address the misconduct that we see here in our own backyard. With the lives of people such as Anthony Baez, Eric Garner, George Floyd, and many, many more lost over these decades, I want to thank Congressman Jeffries for introducing this bill and naming it after Eric Garner, whose tragic murder fueled a movement that got us to this place we find ourselves today. And as we remember his last words, I can't breathe, a rallying cry for activists everywhere fighting against police misconduct and brutality. This resolution before you is an anti chokehold bill that would set the national standard for excessive police force. And I ask that you vote aye to help see it through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Rivera. Lance, are there any additional members that would like to speak on today's resolutions? No, Madam Majority Leader. Okay. I will now read today's resolutions onto the record. Pre-considered Resolution 1343 calls upon the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign the Eric Garner Excessive Use of Force Prevention Act of 2019, HR number 4408, which would prohibit police chokeholds and other tactics that result in asphyxiation. We will now have a voice vote on today's resolution. If you wish to vote against or abstain from today's resolution, please notify the Legislative Documents Unit by email. Will all those in favor say aye? Aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The ayes have it. We will now move and have general discussion. As a reminder, please wait until the Sergeant at Arms begins the countdown clock before you re begin your remarks. Madam Majority Leader. Yes. Council members Rose and Rivera wish to speak in general discussion. Thank you. We'll begin with Council Member Rose, followed by Council Member Rivera. Starting time. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. The, the evils of slavery is more than a chapter in American history books. The legacy of systemic, brutal dehumanization of human beings, sanctioned and practiced by men and women like Thomas Jefferson, still lives with us today. The disparities we experience daily in education, healthcare, and public safety as well as often violent interactions between NYPD and people of color are a direct result of slavery. This is why we protest, this is why we kneel, and this is why we must say Black Lives Matter. As a member of the city council, I work with my colleagues to rid our society of this legacy and make this a more fair, equitable city. Doing so under the statue that commemorates a man who enslaved human beings is unacceptable for many of us, and it is truly painful. Thomas Jefferson enslaved more than 600 men, women, and children during his lifetime. His words are, all men are created equal, but they were not matched by his actions, which included the ability to sell, buy, mortgage, and lease human beings. He believed black people to be racially inferior, said that black Americans and white Americans could not live peacefully side by side, and he fathered as many as six children with the woman whom he enslaved. I believe that the New York City Council should neither glorify nor ignore this dark side of American history. I am not the first to raise this issue. I want to thank those who came before us here, most notably Assembly Member and former City Council Member Charles Barron, as well as my colleague Inez Barron and my colleagues in the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus. I also want to thank Speaker Johnson for understanding what many Americans do not, that this is a symbol that perpetuates racism and inequality. And I want to thank you for taking action, Speaker Johnson. The immediate removal of the statue is long overdue. 
And I'm proud to say that it will bring us yet another step closer to truly living up to the inclusive values that we talk about every day. So I wanna thank you all. Um, I wanna thank you Speaker Johnson and the Black and Latino Asian Caucus and, and uh, Council Member Barron and Council Member um, Adrian Adams and Danique Miller for helping to push this very important issue and the majority leader, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Rose. And then we have Council Member Rivera. Starting time. I, I can yield my time, I think. I have two housing bills that I'm introducing today that I wanted to speak to, but I think I'll just uh, yield my time and say thank you to everyone for your words on the important bills on police brutality and misconduct that we passed today. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Are there any other members who wish to speak on general discussion? Yes, Madam Majority Leader. Council Members Barron and Menchaca. Council Member Barron, you may begin. Starting time. Council Member Barron, we can't hear you. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. How are you, Arnett? Yes. Thank you. OK. Uh, the current protests in America and across the world spurred by the recent police killings of unarmed George, George Floyd is a call by millions to end institutionalized racism that result in injustice in the court systems, inequity in social programs, marginalization in literary and cultural systems, and discrimination in economic opportunities, and yes, death for black and brown people in the racist capitalist system. In cities across the nation, legislative bodies are designing profound, bold measures to create new models of policing and requiring that police accountability boards be composed entirely of community residents. The legislation that is being drafted calling for an elected civilian review board has three main tenets. One, that all of the members are elected. Two, that the decision of the board be binding by, to the commissioner and that he implement them. And three, that there be an independent prosecutor, not a part of the attorney general or the district attorney because they use police for their investigations. And as a legislative body that represents millions, we have the opportunity to show that we understand that symbols matter and we're glad to know that the statue of Thomas Jefferson will be removed. In 2002, my husband, then a council member, Charles Barron, was the first to call for the statue to be removed. And I've carried that baton since my tenure coming in. The BLAC as a body has endorsed that and other members beyond the BLAC are supportive of that. So we look forward to the removal of the statue imminently. And in that same vein, I am calling for eliminating the Pledge of Allegiance as a part of our proceedings. The refrains Black Lives Matter and No Justice, No Peace mean business will not go on as usual while Black and Brown people are brutalized and victimized by the very systems of this country. The ongoing massive protests that have taken to the streets are the demands for ever-growing throngs of people who demand that deep, radical change beyond gaining access to police personnel records, beyond requiring that additional training be done, beyond requiring a loss of vacation days, lead to the fact that we're demanding that police be charged, arrested, vigorously prosecuted, and when convicted, go to jail. So I wanna thank my colleagues, and I wanna invite you all to our 19th annual Juneteenth celebration. That has been the event that Charles and I have sponsored uh, for 19 years. And we do recognize that Juneteenth did not, in fact, free the slaves, that those that were enslaved, because the 13th Amendment didn't get passed until December of 1865. So that Juneteenth celebration was earlier, and it did not end slavery. What it did was it ended the military campaign that was focused on that. So I want to thank you all and invite you to go to my website 
and see the information about the Juneteenth. It will be a virtual celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Thank you. And now we'll have Councilmember Menchaca. Starting time. Only by defunding the NYPD and reinvesting that money back into our communities will we achieve a fair and just people's budget that ensures a just and equitable recovery from COVID-19. Yet right now we've heard and we, all of us understand that the mayor is standing in our way, which is why New Yorkers are calling for his resignation. And I'm calling on this body to express a loss of confidence in the mayor and for the governor to remove him from office. For decades, we have falsely assumed that more cops mean more public safety. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the public safety does not come from more cops, mm -hmm. more jails, or more punishment, but from investing in critical resources that address the root causes of trauma, right. displacement, and poverty. Yeah. The safest communities in America do not have more police, That's but more resources. Just compare wider, more affluent areas of the city with less white and less affluent areas, better schools, better services, and better investments mean less police, less reliance on the criminal justice system. That reality should extend to all, yet COVID-19 pandemic has destroyed any semblance that our city's approach is working. Even, even if Black, Brown, Latinx, immigrant New Yorkers survive COVID-19, they could still die at the hands of a militarized and unaccountable carceral system. We are failing our most fundamental function to protect the most vulnerable. Recognizing this, these same New Yorkers are demanding nothing short of a complete reimagining. We keep on hearing it over and over to get today, a reimagining of public safety to ensure a just and equitable recovery, a vision to end our reliance on policing and incarceration and instead prioritize community needs with community led solutions. But the mayor's response to these demands was to send more police who then brutalized peaceful protesters and the press and whose actions the mayor denied or downplayed, even today. But the mayor's response to these demands to send more police is wrong. So watching in horror, New Yorkers have realized that the mayor re represents the single greatest obstacle, the single greatest obstacle to peace and justice in New York City and to passing a fair and just budget, a people's budget. So I believe it is our duty and the people's representatives to elevate all the demands of accountability and to debate them openly in New Yorkers spaces on Zoom in a public hearing as soon as possible. And I'm asking the speaker of the city council and the chair and our body to put something on the calendar as soon as possible in July so that we can look forward to organizing and speaking our voices. This should be a debate between the people and we should be listening. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader, Council Members Adams, Miller, and Vallone wish to speak. Council Member Adams, you may begin. Starting time. Thank you so much, Madam Majority Leader. Um, I, I just want to speak as a, one of the co-chairs of the uh, Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus um, and to commemorate um, my mother, sister, auntie, um, Council Member Barron, uh, and uh, her husband, Uncle Charles Barron. Uh, for their hard work uh, in, in seeing to it that the statue of Thomas Jefferson is removed. You know, the first day that I walked into chambers, I felt, I felt exhilaration. I felt my spirit say, welcome home. And then I looked up and saw Slave Master looking down on my head. Um, on the strength of Sally Hemings, who fathered many of his children, who continue to be enslaved under Thomas Jefferson, I can't wait for that statue to be removed. We will celebrate. It will be amazing. It will be wonderful. And it is so overdue. I congratulate Council Member Rose, Council Members Barron, Assembly Member Barron. What a day for the New York City Council. He's coming down and he's getting out of our chambers. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you so much, Council Member Adams. And we will now hear from Council Member Miller and then Council Member Vallone. Starting time. Thank you, uh, 
Madam Majority Leader, um, I want to echo what was said and uh, so eloquently said by uh, my, my co-chair, also Council Members Barron, as well as Council Member Rose with the removal of the Jefferson statue is, is long overdue. I also want to remind folks that um, <clears throat> last year we were visited in the chambers by PS 34 in, in uh, Hollis, Queens. And the first thing that this group of elementary school students noticed was that statue. And we made a promise to them that that statue would be gone when they came back. And so they will no longer have that in their future. They will not, not no longer, when they are members of the council, won't have that symbol hanging over their head. I want to thank the members of the Black Latino Asian Caucus for the work that they've done on this package of bills that happened here today. And I most of all, I also want to thank the speaker. I want to thank him for his leadership, but I want to thank him also for his understanding. When, when we, we spoke, nearly every day, right? Between Adrian, myself, and, 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 and the Executive Council, along with the Speaker, and, and, and his leadership team. But our early message to our colleagues and, 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 and our allies was kind of just fall back um, and let us have this experience. We need your support, but that support comes in the matter of, in, in, in this moment of you just falling back and, 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 and thank you for that understanding. And, and then the eventual support standing in the street, as Jimmy said, being in the protest with the young people, but kind of falling back and allowing them to have their moment. Thank you, Paul, for the phone calls that we kind of went back and forth and ultimately getting you to where you are today, to Barry, to, 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 to Rory, and, 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 kind of, and, and so many others um, that we've spoken to for your support. Um, but most of all, the understanding that, you know, that Black lives do matter and that there's a lot of work to, 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 uh, for us to do as we move forward. And I look forward to working each and every one of you all in doing so. And this just a reminder, we're going to be prompt, but the BLAC is meeting immediately after. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for the reminder and Council Member Vallone. Starting time. Uh, thank you for that. I, I just wanted to remind everyone who's listening at this point of the state, if this is where a council member speak their individual thoughts, these are not the thoughts of the entire body. So when somebody says, uh, we want to remove the pledge of allegiance from a state or a city council hearing, make sure, you know, I am opposed to that. And I'm sure there's many others also. So we will have discussions on that. That's not something that's going to happen until we all discuss major conversations over something like that over our country. Uh, and I take odds with that. So I just wanted to put mine on the record for that. And thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Yes. There are no other members who wish to speak. I believe you have an announcement before you turn it back over to the speaker. Yes, let me pull the announcement up. Give me a moment. At this time, uh, we want to have a, a corrected reading um, by Billy Martin after general discussion. I want to clarify the vote on one of the bills today. Intro 536B passed by a vote of 47 in the affirmative, three in the negative, and no abstentions. And I just wanted to make that clear. And I will just close out just by, I want to thank my son, uh, Prince, who has gone through this entire four months with me, watching 10 to 12 hours of television every day, missing meals. We're still behind in diaper training, but I do all of this essentially inspired by him. And every day I go to bed feeling guilty that I have not spent enough time with him, especially in his developmental years. So I just want to dedicate today to him and um, to all of the fathers. I have a father who is 82 years old. I have a brother who is 50 years old, who are both the, the fathers of five children each. And we did this today so that hopefully my son can be a father and to have a family. And so I'm so supportive of all of them. And 
I thank everyone. I, I'm so inspired and excited by what we're seeing right now. The young people from here to Australia have spoken loudly. They refuse to inherit the world that we are giving them and are fighting to change it, to have a better world, a more just and equitable world. And we are listening. And all of what you're seeing today could not have happened if you didn't have the bravery and the courage to continue. If we look at the, the Montgomery bus boycotts, they lasted over 381 days. So we have to continue to stay vigilant because it is your energy, your protest, your voice that's allowing legislation that has taken generations to pass, to pass today. And we're gonna continue to pass legislation and to continue to have budget changes that are more reflective of the world that you deserve to inherit. But I also wanna say that I'm inspired uh, by the global energy that we're seeing, but the Black Lives Matter movement must be a complete movement. And I would be remiss if I didn't as a black woman speak on this. This is a moment of justice, equality and transformation that must include the shared fight for justice for all black people, black women included. Black women are at the forefront of the Black Lives Matter movement, the Democratic Party, the Me Too movement, the pay parity and pay equity movements. We are the heads of our households. We have to make sure that our voice is lifted up equitably during this Black Lives Matter movement. Malcolm X once said that the most unprotected woman in America is the black woman. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. And we have to make sure that black women are respected and are lifted up equitably. If black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the, de the destruction of all systems of oppression. And Sojourner Truth also said it when she said, ain't I a woman demanding a woman's equal place in this world. And as we look and as we continue to lift up George Floyd, I want us to continue to lift up Breonna Taylor equally. She was gunned down in a hail of eight bullets and we have to make sure that she receives justice. While she successfully in her death, people have lifted up her name and we have created a law, the Breonna Taylor law that outlaws no knock warrants that allowed police officers to enter her home late at night without knocking, with guns drawn. And we have to dismantle all forms of racism and we have to demand that our uh, entire system rises up to demand justice from Attorney General Daniel Cameron, as well as Governor Andy Bashir, demanding that those that are responsible for the death of Breonna Taylor are brought to justice. And I just want to close by continuing to lift up the names of black women who have also been lost at the hands of law enforcement. Pamela Turner, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, Corinne Gaines, Atiana Jefferson, Chantel Davis, Eleanor Bumpers, Deborah Danner, and so many others who we have lost at this time. Again, I wanna close with just saying the Black Lives Matter movement has to equally lift up men and women. When we lift up George, we must lift up Brianna because this movement will not truly be equitable and truly complete until we are all seen as equitable. Thank you. And I wanna thank Speaker Corey Johnson for having the courage and the tenacity to listen, to hear, and to act. You have been incredible during this entire time and we wanna to continue to work with you and to continue to change because this is the most historical moment in history. This is the most historical moment in history. I've never felt like I was part of anything until this moment. We are in the cusp and it will be recorded by our artists, by our filmmakers, by our writers, this time in history and the role that we played. And so it's important that we are measured and understanding that the role that we play is going to go down in history. And it's important for us to continue to err on the right side of history. So thank you so much to all of my colleagues. Thank you for all of those who had the courage to stand up today. And I continue to look forward to being a part of this city council that creates real change. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader, always for your incredibly moving, beautiful, inspiring remarks. And 
I love your son, Prince. He is such a gift. He is so beautiful. I was there on the first day that he was born, I right know. after you had him. <laughs> and, uh, he is just a total treasure in this world. And you are such an amazing mom. You are Thank such you. an amazing mom. And you've been an amazing mom to your son since the day he was born, even before he was born. So for you to dedicate today to him is uh, really emotionally stirring and moving and uh, got me a little emotional actually to hear you talk about him that way because I love him so much. So thank, um, so thank you, Lori. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Thank you to all of our colleagues. The stated meeting of June 18th, before I say this, before I adjourn the meeting, I just want to make a remark, a comment. We are not putting up with the budget that was given to us by this mayor. We are not putting up with it. We are gonna fund social services and human services and communities of color and schools and youth programs and cure violence initiatives. We know we have a $10 billion budget deficit and we as a council have been working, as you can talk, you can ask every member on this call right now, literally every single day on identifying savings, on even being willing to cut some of our own programs that we like uh, to achieve savings. But the budget that's been presented to us in the executive budget and the lack of responsiveness and movement when we have sent letters, we sent a letter calling for a reduction in the NYPD's budget before George Floyd was murdered. We did that. Debbie Rose has been talking about SYEP and Cornerstone and Beacon and Sonic every single day since that executive budget was unveiled, defunding 135,000 youth slots across New York City. We are not putting up with it. This city council is not putting up with it. So I'm saying this to the public, I'm saying this to the mayor, I'm saying this to everyone. This is not a normal budget year. That's right. It's not a normal negotiation, give and take, little bit here, little bit there. No. These communities that have been ravaged by COVID-19, and I don't want to overly generalize because I know that the youth programs serve all youth, but predominantly they serve black and brown youth. They serve low income, vulnerable black and brown youth across New York City. We are not putting up with you decimating these programs. We aren't doing it. This council will not vote for a budget like that. We need to cut the NYPD and invest that money back into communities in a meaningful way. And if this council has to look at our own budget, as the city charter allows us to, we will potentially do that. Because we're not we are not, we are not passing a budget that does not work for New Yorkers. That means cutting the NYPD's budget significantly, re reinvesting in communities of color, restoring all of those youth programs, restoring that education money, restoring money for immigrants, restoring money for seniors, restoring money for children, restoring money for social services yes. and human services. Our initiatives that this council funds every year, that is us filling the gap of what city government is not doing. We are funding nonprofits that are doing work that the government isn't doing in undocumented communities, at naturally occurring retirement communities, children who are on the spectrum, special ed children, we are not, they are not a political chip or pawn in this game. That's right. I have the goosebumps saying it right now. We are not doing it. We are not doing it. So look at our cuts. Look at what we proposed on the NYPD. Look at what we've proposed on other agencies. This council will not pass a budget that is not just, that is not fair, and that is not equitable. We are not doing it. We will be here. I mean, I have nowhere to go. We will be here until the night of June 30th. We can even go into July if we have to. That's right. 
but this is not a game. We are not allowing these nonprofits, this education money, this youth money to be a pawn, to be a bargaining chip in this process. We're not, we're not doing it. The budget that is being proposed, the budget that is attempting to be negotiated with this council, I'm not sure five members would vote for the budget. So I, I didn't plan on saying this today, but you know, I just wanna be crystal clear. I wanna be transparent. I want the public to know. I want the administration to know. I want the colleagues to know. This is a reckoning. This moment is a reckoning in our country and in our city. And the old rules are out the window. This is about us using every charter mandated power that was given to us in 1989, which gave the city council budget authority away from the board of estimate. And it is prescribed in there and we will use it. And if, if people want to impound money that is nonprofit human services money, that is crazy and the height of a pandemic. So we, uh, you know, I did not run this by the members saying this today. I didn't say I was gonna say this at Democratic conference yesterday, but I felt moved to say this because so much of this moment is not just about legislation. The legislation we did is good and it's important and I'm glad we did it and it's a nice first step, but it is about fundamentally shifting things. It's about a reckoning. And we are not putting up with you cutting black and brown nonprofits or holding them hostage. We're not doing it. That's what defunding the NYPD means. It means taking money that is unnecessary right now and putting it into housing and education and health and social services and human services and youth programs and rehabilitative programs. That's what we're fighting for. Today is June 18th. We have sent letter after letter. We have pushed since the day the executive budget came out. Debbie Rose has literally spent hundreds of hours working on this. Our demands are clear. You are not cutting safety net programming in this moment. You aren't doing it. You aren't doing it. That's what this moment calls for. And that's what this council will stand up for. And we will do it every day until we get a budget that works for us and for the people of New York City, who we represent, who we hear from, who we see at the grocery store, who have been protesting in the streets. Listen to this moment, hear this moment, be a part of this moment. Don't let history pass you by, by tinkering around the edges. Let's do something transformative. Don't nickel and dime us and don't nickel and dime communities that have been underfunded for years and we see what COVID-19 has done to them. We are standing united together to get this done. The stated meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you all very much. We stand with you, Speaker. United. Thank you, Margaret. Well said. Representing our, res our constituents. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. I hope, everyone, I, hope, I hope everyone who's watching sees that this is not just me. This whole body feels this way. I would say the vast majority of the body feels this way. That's right. A super majority that could override a veto feels this Thank way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We're with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. The stated, meeting, the stated meeting of June 18th, 2020 
is hereby adjourned and we will be back in the next two weeks or longer for Bud